I'm, uh, I'm beginning a new series this morning. I'm excited about this series. It's going to be short. It's just going to be for the remainder of the Sundays in June, but I'm excited about this. I'm speaking on uh, the Holy Spirit um, for all of these, and I, I call this series Elements. We want to look at the Holy Spirit as described by what, even since ancient times, have been considered the the essential elements. Even the ancient Greeks and before them knew these things were sort of the traditionally recognized elements. Issues, uh, things like wind, uh, things like um, water, earth, and of course fire. So these are the four that we're going to talk about in the next four weeks. Next week, I don't know if you know this or not, but next week is Pentecost Sunday. And so I'm, I'm going to be speaking on fire next week for Pentecost Sunday. But this morning, I want to begin this series with elements, and this morning, we want to talk about water. So we begin this series on the elements with water. Turn, if you will, to the New Testament. We're going to read a couple of verses, but we're actually going to spend all of our time in the Old Testament, but we're going to start in the New Testament. So turn, if you will, to John chapter 7 and verse 37. John 7 And 37, we're going to read that, but then we're going to spend most of our time in, of all books, Ezekiel. But John 7 and 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast. So this is one of the feast days. Jesus is in Jerusalem. All right, on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, As the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this Jesus spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified or resurrected from the dead. But look again, whoever believes in me, look at verse 38, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now turn, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. It's very close to the end of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 47 and verse 1. This is a vision that Ezekiel the prophet had. It's a prophecy. It's not actually happening per se. It is something that Ezekiel is seeing. It's a vision. It's a prophecy. Ezekiel 47 and verse 1. Then he... That is not Jesus. It's probably an angel that has appeared in Ezekiel's um, vision. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east. And there was water running out on the right side. Let's pray. Lord, I ask in the next few moments that you will move in this place. Let your Holy Spirit descend on us. We need to encounter you this morning. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Water is life. Water is life. Theoretically, you can go up to or even maybe more than 60 days without food. Theoretically, I don't suggest it, but theoretically, you could go more than 60 days without food. But you will not last more than 72 hours. Not days, hours. Three days. And by the end of the third day, I promise you, you will be in bad shape without water. Food, two months. No water, Three days. Three days with no water. Water is life. And that's why I wanted to begin with this element for this series. Because Jesus says to them, imagine this, he is in the middle of the temple, people all around him, the crowds, the throngs of people, and Jesus lifts up his hands, lifts up his eyes, lifts up his voice, and he says, anyone who comes to me shall never thirst, and out of their hearts will flow rivers of living water. And John tells us that that this was regarding the Holy Spirit. He said it hasn't happened yet, but Jesus said this, talking about the filling, the presence of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus himself equates the idea of water with the presence and the filling of the Holy Spirit. 
Why? Because it all comes down to life. Water is life. And Jesus knew that the filling of the Holy Spirit was life. Life. Now turn back, if you will, to Ezekiel. This is a a long prophecy. Water and all kinds of stuff happens. But I want to walk us through this. So as we said, Ezekiel goes with a man in his vision and he shows Ezekiel the temple. And out of the temple, right there by the altar, there is a river of water, a trickle. It's not a huge thing. It's just a stream of water that is flowing out from the altar, under the temple, and out into the land. All right, that's where we pick up. Look at Ezekiel 47 and 3. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters, and the waters came up to my knees. And again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through, and the water came up to my waist. The further and further they get from the temple, the deeper and the deeper the water gets. This is God's call to all of us. The first thing in this prophecy is the water becomes deeper. The water becomes deeper. This is a call to all of us for new levels of spiritual maturity and for new levels of discipleship. We are not supposed, listen to me, if your level of spirituality and your relationship with God is exactly the same now as it was the day that you began the relationship with Him, something is wrong. Something is wrong. We all know this in our married life. Courtney and I have been married for more than 22 years. Our relationship now is deeper. It's more intimate. It's more authentic. We've gone through wonderful times and we've gone through terrible times and she has helped me and lifted me up and sustained me and I hope I've done a little bit of the same for her. Much more her towards me than me towards her. But she's helped me. She's brought me through. We've encouraged each other. We've had kids together. Those kids have driven us crazy together. We've gone gone through some stuff after 22 years. The relationship now is significantly better than it was on the day I said I do. And it should be for all of us. We know that on a human level, right? We understand that about these relationships. Those of you, four and a half years ago, none of you knew me. And I didn't know any of you. Now, four and a half years later, there are people in this church that no matter what happens in the future, I will call my friends for the rest of my life. Why? Because the relationship has grown. And yet, so many of us refuse to do that with God. Yes, I want to be saved. And God says, great, let's begin that relationship. You go, nope, that's all I wanted, God. Just some life insurance for eternity. See you later. And we never, ever grow. That's why I've almost stopped asking people, are you saved? Because everybody, especially I've talked about this, especially in the South, especially with people that grew up in a Baptist church, everybody's saved. Everybody's saved. You ask people, are you saved? Everybody's saved. It's almost a foolish thing to ask anymore. What I want to know is, where is your relationship with God? When's the last time you prayed? When's the last time you read your Bible? When's the last time you spent time alone in the presence of the creator of the universe? Come on, I'm not negating or saying that salvation is bad or anything, but I'm saying that because we have focused so much on that, we have diminished what we're supposed to be doing. The further from the temple, the deeper the water. The further from the temple, the deeper the water. You're supposed to be going out and out and out. You're supposed to be growing. You're supposed to become more mature. Not just you, all of us. You don't want a pastor that's the same guy he was when I got here four and a half years ago. You want a pastor that's growing. Everybody, this is the vacation time, so we never have everybody in church for the next like two and a half months, right? There's always somebody missing. And primarily, we all go to the beach, primarily. I'm not really a beach guy. I don't particularly enjoy the beach. One of the main reasons I don't like the beach is because I have a pretty significant phobia of the ocean. I am not a fan of the ocean. 
In particular, I'm not a fan of what lives in the ocean. That's the problem. The idea of water, I have no, I like pools. I like pools. I don't like oceans. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't go into the, if I can't see my feet, I'm too deep, okay? So we're immediately, I'm serious. Oh, can't, we start immediately backing towards the shore until I can see my feet again. I don't like going out swimming, right? And then you're, and then your bathing suit string brushes against your leg. Ah! Jellyfish, right? And I do this desperate paddle back to shore. You're like, oh, good news, just my bathing suit string. I, I, I thought I was being eaten by jaws there, right? I, I, don't, I don't enjoy the deepness of the ocean. So many of us, so many of us do the same thing in our walk with God. God says, come out deeper. Well, look how it goes. Look how it goes. Look back at verse 3. The water's up to the ankles. Then the water's to the knees. Then the water's to the waist. Constantly being called into a deeper, more intimate, and more authentic relationship. Most of us, we're willing to start the relationship, and we're okay with the water coming over our ankles. But that's not what God's call to us is. God called, says, come out to the deep water. Okay, I'll go to my knees. Oh, okay, I'll go to my waist. God is consistently calling all of us to a deeper and deeper relationship. How do we get there? The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. All of this goes back to, and there shall be rivers of living water. And Jesus spoke this concerning the Holy Spirit. Now back to Ezekiel. Now look at verse 5. And again, he measured a thousand. Remember, it's ankles, knees, waist. Now look at verse 5. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me back and returned me to the bank of the river. The next thing is this. The water cannot be controlled. This is so important if you really want to experience and, and have a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit in your life. The water cannot be controlled. My feeling is that is most of the problems that most of the people have with the idea of the Holy Spirit. Right? If I, if I, if I experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit then I'm not going to have any control over this. Listen to me. Uh, that's right. That, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you on that. That's how this works. You get thrown into a river which cannot be crossed. You're swimming and the current takes you. I would much rather let, I would much rather let the current of the river of God take me where he wants me than me try to paddle to places that I want to go. I would much rather want that. It becomes a river that cannot be crossed in which one must swim. And I look at, I love this part, verse six. And the man said to me, have you seen this? That's all he says. Have you seen this? And then he takes me and returns me to the bank, the bank of the river. The water cannot be controlled. You have to be willing to submit your future, your wants, your desires your, 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 what you thought was going to happen, all of that must be submitted to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So many of us refuse the filling of the Holy Spirit because we don't want to cede control to anything or anybody or anyone. And so we go through life with our hands super glued to the steering wheel. And God says, I know it's scary. I know it's scary, but I want to throw you into a river which you cannot cross. And we go, no way, dude. <laughs> no, no way. I'm driving this car exactly where I want it to go. That, the, the, the water cannot be controlled. I, heard, I saw an interview with somebody just recently. And this guy said that he had somebody in his church ask him, why does the Holy Spirit do so many weird things. I would not classify those as weird, but that's what somebody in his church asked. 
Why does the Holy Spirit do so, much, so many weird things? This guy had a great answer. He said, it just seems like weird things because it's God things. And that's exactly right. It's exactly right. Think of all the weird stuff that is in this book. And everybody okay with it? Everybody okay with it? Think of all the weird things that are in this book. Jehoshaphat is being attacked in the Old Testament. And he prays to God and says, God, what should we do? I want to rescue the people and save my kingdom and save me and save my family. God says, here's what you need to do. You need to not take an army out, but get a bunch of uh, musicians. Put the musicians at the front, have them play and sing, and then you'll win the battle. I don't know if you'd know a lot of musicians. I don't feel like warrior comes to mind when I think of musician. Besides Luke, who spends roughly 10 hours a day in the gym. But besides Luke, who looks like a warrior, I, I don't think of musicians being your warrior, right? But all of us reading that, we go, praise God. That's wonderful. No, it's weird. If you don't think that's weird, the, the, the disciples come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we have more than 5,000 people here. 5,000 men alone. That doesn't include kids and babies and women and all the rest of it. We're out in a deserted place, a desolate place. We've got nothing to feed them. Jesus says, you've got to have something. They say, well, we've got a little bit of bread and some sardines. Jesus says, make all the people sit down. That's weird. Do you understand that? That's weird. Make all the people sit down. They sit down. Jesus prays over it. Lord, um, you know, help these people get full. And breaks the bread and says, now pass it out. If I was Simon Peter, I'd be like, pass out this half a loaf of bread to 5,000 people. And what happens? They all get fed. And there's 12 basketfuls left over. You know what? The water cannot be controlled. If you are unwilling to let the Holy Spirit move in your life because you don't want to see weird stuff, then I got news for you. You're not going to see the Holy Spirit move in your life because God's stuff is kind of weird stuff. It's kind of odd stuff. It kind of requires us to give up control. It kind of requires us to take our hands off of it. It kind of requires us to say, you know what? I am willing to be thrown into a river that cannot be crossed because I would rather be in the center of God's will in a river that cannot be crossed than doing what I want on the ground, on the dry land. That is what it's about. So those are for us. The water is deep. A call to intimacy. The water cannot be controlled. A call to us to take our hands off of it. But glory to God, it doesn't end there. Look back now at Ezekiel 47 and verse 9. We're going to skip to verse 9 now. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. Keep that up there for me. And everything will live wherever the river goes. The water brings life to us. The water brings life to us. Everywhere the water goes, we'll live. And there shall be rivers of living water that flow out of who? Us. The people that receive the Holy Spirit, they shall be rivers of living water. And the rivers shall, and everything shall live wherever the waters go. Now I want you to look at this though. Look at verse 11 though. The same Ezekiel 11. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. The water heals. The water can heal relationships. It can heal marriages. It can heal your past. It can heal your pain. It can heal your future. It can heal your frustration, your discouragement, your depression. The water will heal. But only where we let the water go. Makes it very clear. The swamps and the marshes will not be healed. The water heals where, whatever the water touches. Now this goes back to what I was talking about during praise and worship. We say things like, Jesus, you're my everything. God, you're my everything. And yet we 
constantly and consistently compartmentalize our lives. This is the stuff that God can talk to me about. This is the stuff that I've submitted to him. And these are the things that I refuse to give to God. Wherever the water touches, it's healed. You have things in your life that haven't been healed. My question to you is, have you allowed the penetrating presence of the Holy Spirit to flow into those areas? So many of us say, well, I don't understand why God, why this isn't happening. I don't understand why I haven't been healed. But yet we allow the swamps of our past to remain untouched by the healing water of the Holy Spirit. So we have the swamp of our pain, the swamp of whatever, the swamp of our, of our marriage, of our relationship with our family, extended family, whatever it is, we have these swampy, marshy bogs. And we say, why, won't, why hasn't God healed that? Why can't I find restoration for that? And then when the Holy Spirit, the water of the Holy Spirit begins to flow in that, we immediately build a dam and say, no, 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 you can't come in there. And then we're amazed and, and, and confused by why we can't find healing for the swampy areas. The water heals anywhere it touches. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit full access to all those areas. My best friend growing up was named Brian. Brian was my best friend growing up. We did everything together. We're still friends to this day. He, he always had terrible ideas that seemed like great ideas at the time. <laughs> I don't know if you had friends like that. But I was always the like, yeah, sure, that sounds like fun. I was a pretty agreeable little guy. And, and, and Brian always had Terrible ideas that seem like great ideas. One time we built a barricade across the street where he lived. If you growing up, my kids don't play outside as much as I did. Do you ever build barricades across the whole street? We did that. And then he had a next door neighbor who was a reservist in the Air Force. And he had given Brian, who had a lot of bad ideas. I want to remind you of that. A lot of bad ideas. He gave a kid with a lot of bad ideas a bunch of smoke grenades. Not real grenades, but smoke grenades. So we built a barricade of sticks and rocks and everything across the entire street where he lived. I'm not talking about like a little thing, like a barricade, right? And then when car pulled up and stopped, we popped those smoke grenades and threw them out there. That seemed like a great idea. The police informed us later that it was a terrible idea. The police informed my parents and his parents, that's a terrible idea. Seemed great to me. Now, one of the other things that we did all about, and you'll be interested to know this, he later joined the army and was an engineer in the army. He was an engineer in the army. So one of the other things that we did was we would build dams in this, the roads in his neighborhood had huge culverts in the side. And anytime anybody watered their grass or more specifically washed their car, washed their boat, the water would flow down those culverts. And we lived for that. We would go out there and make dams and redirect the flow of the water, stop it all together, make it flow on this side, and then build another one and make it flow back that way. And it was always amazing to me how you could control the flow of that water without doing much. You just build a little dam that's a little bit taller than the water and you could just control it, back it up, send it one direction, send it the other direction. The power and the presence and the filling of the Holy Spirit is exactly the same way. He offers us life. The water brings life to us. Look again at the end of verse 9. And everything will live wherever the water goes. My question to you is, where are you allowing the water to go in your life? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to penetrate those places that you have refused to submit to Him? the unforgiveness that you'd rather hold on to than find freedom, the pain and the past that you would rather keep behind a, a dam, refusing to let the water flow. You can find life. But listen to me. The only way you do that is by allowing the water to flow wherever it wants to go. And everything will live wherever the water goes. 
Now the final thing is this. Look at verse 12. 47 and 12. Along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. In both the old, in, in the, several times in the Old Testament, over and over again, we believers, Christians, the, it says the righteous man, especially in Psalms, we are referred to as trees. Over and over again, in Psalm 1 in particular, read Psalm 1 sometime. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water. The righteous person, the righteous man, the righteous woman shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water. It says his leaf shall not wither. It's the same thing that's in Ezekiel. It's fascinating. So what does that mean to us? Even in the New Testament, what does Paul tell us? The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit in both the Old and New Testament. So what does this passage from Ezekiel tell us? And it is this. The water brings healing to others. The water brings healing to others. The water brings a life to us. If we allow the water to penetrate the swamps and marshes and bogs and the things that we've kept from God, it brings life to everything it touches. But glory to God, that's not it. The water also brings healing to everybody else. This is what being filled with the Holy Spirit is supposed to be about. Life for us, healing for others. What fruit are you bearing? Love, joy, peace, patience. So many of those, all of those really, have to do with the other people in your life. You cannot be, you cannot have more self-control for yourself. It's self-control for the people in your life that drive you crazy. Kindness, gentleness, patience. Patience is for others. The fruit is for everybody else. The water, the Holy Spirit, the presence, the filling of the Holy Spirit brings us life, which is wonderful, but it's also supposed to bring healing to everybody else. Now look at what it is. They will bear fruit. Look at 12 again. They will bear fruit every month. That's important. Because any of you that know anything about farming, which I don't, but any of you that know anything about it or know anything about trees or know anything about vegetables in general. <laughs> Anybody that knows anything about that in general knows what? They don't bloom every month. You're not getting fruit every month. You're getting fruit maybe once a year, if you're lucky. And the fruit and the tree has to live for a long, long time. The team that I'm taking with me, well, you've met him as well. He's been here. Sammy O'Dono, he planted a bunch of fruit trees on the property, the Global Servants headquarters, years ago. Every year I would go, Sammy, you got any fruit yet? Not yet, Travis. Go back the next year, you got any fruit yet? Not yet. At four, three, four, five years into it, I told him, I said, Sammy, you're not ever going to get any fruit. I, 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 don't, I think you got bad trees, man. I, I, don't, I don't know a lot about trees, but I feel like you got bad trees. You're never going to have any fruit. Finally, like six years later, I went, and he was so proud to show me that all the trees had finally borne fruit five, six years later, and by the way, only once a year. But it says the trees that are planted by rivers of living water bear fruit monthly, or what? Constantly, continually, all the time. All the time they bear fruit, and the fruit is for food. The fruit is to encourage. The fruit is to help others. The fruit is for food. The trees can't eat their own fruit. It's for others to eat. And their leaves are medicine. Their leaves are medicine. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you, how many of us, and I want to challenge you, how many of us have leaves that are bitter instead of medicine? How many of us, when people, when you tell people, I am a Christ follower, I am a believer, I'm a Christian, whatever nomenclature you put on it, when you tell people that, are they shocked because your leaves are so bitter? Or do they understand, yeah, that makes sense because you're the nicest guy, the nicest woman in this office. So many of us, I'll tell you, 
Fascinating story. I was the executive pastor of outreach and missions at a large church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. My first, my first job at a local church. I've shared about it. Loved my time there. Loved the people there. Great time. We had, I had been there about four or five months, not long. Still learning my way around church. Still believing that everybody in church was actually a Christian. I had a lot of misconceptions. So, Learn, learn, learn that very quickly. <laughs> you didn't laugh because you haven't pastored a church before. Uh, uh, so, I, uh, you know, thought every, everybody was just in, everything was great, wonderful. We started a new initiative called Global Local. This was years ago. So we called it GL 2011. GL 2011. GL 2010 for the year. Global and local. And we were going to raise money and take money. We were going to help people locally. We did all kinds of stuff. We had a food bank and clothing and all kinds of things that we did. Mobile medical center. We had all kind of local stuff. Helping low-income families. Then globally, we had all these missionaries we supported and mission trips we were taking. It was great. And I was excited. GL 2010, GL 2011. It was wonderful. The week after we rolled that initiative out, I was walking through the hall between services and an older lady came up to me. She said, you're the missions pastor, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. How can I help you? She said, I just want you to know, I don't want a dime of the money I give to go to help anybody. I promise you she said that. She said, I don't want a dime of any of the money that I give to help anybody. She said, I give it to this church to do a specific thing, and I don't want it going to folks overseas or people here in the community. And I was just like, oh, I was so, because I was young, and I was all shiny, and I was energetic and excited, and this woman was just like, just stabbing me, and I just deflated and became the, the, the disillusioned shell that you see before you now directly relates to that moment. You don't want your money to help anybody? Are you kidding me? It, it was one of the most disillusioning moments of my entire life. She walked off. I thought, well, that leaf didn't taste like medicine. <laughs> that leaf tasted really, really bitter. Right? How many of us, our leaves are for medicine and our fruit for food? The presence and the filling of the Holy Spirit is supposed to bring healing to everybody else in your life. Now, do you see how this is steps. Do you see how the whole thing builds on itself? See, you go deeper in the relationship and the Holy Spirit begins to show you things and begins to challenge you and begins to take you to places you thought you'd never go. And then eventually you get into a river that cannot be crossed and you have to take your hands off of it and you have to trust that the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you to where it wants, wants to go. And he does. And then the river begins to fill you and it begins to bring life to the stuff that you thought was dead and it brings life to the swamps and the marshes and the water brings healing rivers of living water. But listen to me. The final step is food and medicine for everybody else. You say, I am deeper. I have given the Holy Spirit control. I, I, he has brought life to me. But I'm going to tell you, if you're not bringing healing to the people around you, you still have a ways to go. This is a wonderful example of the life that the Holy Spirit brings. Look back, if you will. I just want to show it to you one more time, and then we're going to close. John chapter 7, where we started. Look at verse 38. John 7 and 38. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Keep that up on the screen. Let me close with this. There's a movie that came out probably about 25 years ago. It was about a fictional president of the United States, played by Michael Douglas. The movie was just an American president, was the name of it. Not one of my favorite films, not a great movie or anything. If you love it, wonderful. But not, I've, I've seen it. As you know, I see almost all movies. So <laughs> I've, I've seen it. But not anything that I would write home about. But Michael Douglas plays the president. 
there's a moment in the Oval Office where his advisors are trying to encourage him to speak leadership and speak, um, speak into this situation that is happening, to be presidential, to lead with leadership. <clears throat> and his advisors say this, they say, Mr. President, people want leadership. They're th so thirsty for it, they'll crawl through the desert toward a mirage. And when they discover that there's no water, they'll drink the sand. Michael Douglas says, people don't drink the sand because they're thirsty. They drink the sand because they can't tell the difference. Now, they're talking about politics and leadership and all the rest of it, but that is a wonderfully relevant quote for us in regards to the Holy Spirit. How many of us, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, are drinking sand and convincing ourselves that we have been filled with the Holy Spirit? Because we don't know the difference. Because we've convinced ourselves that this is all there is. Because we've convinced ourselves that it can't be better than this. Because we've convinced ourselves that there is no, well, how much better, how much, what, what could it be? It's rivers of living water. Jesus said elsewhere, I have come that they might have life and that more abundantly. We are supposed to be drinking out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You don't have to drink the sand one more moment. You can drink the living water. Here's what I always say when we preach on the Holy Spirit, which is this. You go, well, what about all this other stuff with the Holy Spirit? Primarily, what about the gifts of the Spirit? <laughs> uh, you notice, I, and we're not talking about that at all. You want to know why? Because you need life. <laughs> that's the only thing I care about. For That's the only thing I care about. I don't want you to drink sand anymore. Too many of us have drunk sand too long because we can't tell the difference. Rivers of living water. Do you have swamps in your life? Allow the water of the Holy Spirit to penetrate it and everything the water touches will have life. Do you struggle with being kind? Do you struggle with others? Do you struggle with problems with family and friends and co-workers? Our fruit shall be food and our leaves shall be medicine. Do you have trouble taking your hands off of it? then allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to a river that you cannot cross. And then allow Him to guide you in that. I want you to experience life. That's what the Holy Spirit is about. Life. You shall have rivers of living water. You want life this morning? That's what the Holy Spirit brings us. Life for the swamps that are in your spirit and your heart. Life for the swamps. Healing and life for others. Life. 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 Life in the spirit is exactly that. Life. You don't have to drink sand. You can let the rivers of living water flow through your spirit this morning. Let's pray. God, we praise You, we worship You, and we glorify You. Honor You this morning. I'm going to give you a simple, simple, simple invitation. If you want life, I'm just going to encourage you to come to the front and receive the life of the Holy Spirit. Water is life.
And Jesus told us, those that receive the Holy Spirit shall have rivers of living water. Water is life. The Holy Spirit is life abundantly. I don't have some huge thing to end this with, some big fancy altar call or anything else. I'm just telling you and I'm begging you. You don't have to drink sand and you don't have to go home with swamps in your life and hate for others in your heart. The Holy Spirit is life. Life for you, healing for others. That's what He wants. That's what He wants. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill you give you a fresh touch, give you a new touch. You say, oh, I've been saved. Oh, I've done this. Oh, I've done that. Oh, I've prayed to receive the Holy Spirit. My question would be, do you have swamps? Why not pray for a fresh touch? Do you have issues with others? Why not pray for a fresh touch? Are your leaves medicine? If not, then pray for a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. Rivers of living water. That's what you want. When I say amen to this prayer, come to the front and pray for a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. Experience rivers of living water. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.